Hi, welcome back to your virtual learning space. As always, if you learn something interesting, please go teach someone immediately. We're going to dive into zone zero this week. Um, zone zero is highlighted in red. I'm sure we all remember this silly little sketch from last time. Um, I'm going to cover the main house or the, the main living space in the first section because that's an existing structure. And then in the next section, I'm going to move on and cover the studio shed that I'm going to put in. Um, and that's going to be kind of tied up with new structures. Um, zone zero, this is from the old, this is from the, the previous um, presentation, but we're dealing with the home. We're dealing with indoor pets. So that's plants and animals that live in the house. We're going to deal with power management. Uh, that means how to make more and use less. And we're going to deal with waste streams, like um, how to make use of products that we term waste, right? Now, in my zone zero, uh, we have solar panels. Um, and like I said, I'm growing microgreens. You can see them over my shoulder here. Um, they are super tasty. They take up no room and they use less electricity per week than boiling the kettle once. So, I mean... You can't really argue. I've put in about 1.2 liters of water and that's about the only addition that I've made to the system and just does everything itself. Seeds are magic. They contain all the instructions to make massive plants. But if you catch them when they're really small, you can uh, you can get the best nutritional value out of them. So what can we do? Uh, what can we do in zone zero is where we're going to start, right? So we've got produce more consume less and that's going to be like across the board that applies to food that applies to electricity that applies to the energy coming in we want to use it more effectively and we want to we want to put things into reduction and consume less things by by having more production right um we're also going to make a distinction between supplement and satisfy so we all have needs right and if we have a small space there's a good chance that we can only supplement our needs. That doesn't mean that we need to go out of our way to create huge systems to try and satisfy our needs. It just means that we can supplement. We can take a little bit off the top of our economy, of our bills, right? Um, so this is a generalization. Roughly 20% of our economy goes into heating and cooling our space. Um, heating in the cold climates, cooling in the warm climates. Talking about things like AC in desert places, talking about things like central heating in Ireland. So we're, we're dealing with 20% of our economy straight away. And then another 10% of our economy goes on electricity, right? So if we can supplement our heating and cooling and supplement our electricity, we could be knocking 10% off our overall economy, which means that we're having an easier life, right? Um, this is a bit wordy, but uh, just stick with me, right? So modern houses are static, not dynamic. Most modern houses are designed by engineers, and that's fantastic, because engineers make sure that the roof doesn't fall on your head. But engineers like things to be quantifiable, measurable and that means they got to stay the same they can't be dynamic they can't be changing they got to be static and if we can make our houses more reactive more dynamic life becomes just a little bit easier right um i like the little thing like what can our house bring to the table right so we're going to start off with the like baseline we're going to start off right at the beginning what is heat Heat is energy flow from a warmer body to a colder body seeking equilibrium. Nature's always looking for balance and heat always moves to cold quicker than cold moves to heat. So energy flow is, is what we're talking about. And there's three different ways that energy moves or that heat energy moves more specifically, right? Now, does anybody want to put up their hand and have a guess at one of the types of heat transfer here? Convection. Convection. Yeah, Dave, which one is it, though? Hands by the fire. Ah, you see there. Right, so the hands over the fire are convectional heat. Can anyone give a bash off the other two? Convection.
Radiate, <laughs> sir. And radiant. Oh, we got all three. I'm so proud of you guys. Right? So we got conduction, which is represented by the iron bar. So conduction is heat moving through a solid body, right? You heat the end of the iron bar and the other side gets warm, right? We got convection, which is the hands over the fire. And that's because heat always rises, right? It always rises. It's always moving to cool. Um, so that creates convectional currents, which we can talk about a little bit later. But the other type is radiated heat. Now, this drawing isn't like as as careful about describing radiated heat as it is about the other ones. And it's funny because radiated heat is the one we're probably going to discuss the most when it comes to heating and cooling our spaces. But in this instance, it's the hands that are like warming themselves by the fire. Radiated heat travels out kind of like a sphere. It travels out from like a center point in straight lines. And radiated heat only heats solid bodies, right? So in a cool climate, we want to have radiated heat coming out of thermal mass. So the idea that we warm up a something and after we've finished warming it up and the area around it gets cooler, it starts to beat that heat back out. Irish people know this better than almost anyone else I know because we all have radiators in our homes, right? Um, whether it's an electric system that heats up bricks, um, which is called storage heaters during most apartments, or whether it's um, an oil or water filled system, like in most houses, we have um, a gas powered um, radiator system here in this house, and, and that's our heating system. Radiated heat is what you want in a cold climate. Radiated heat is what you want to avoid at all costs in a hot climate. Radiated heat in a hot climate is your enemy, right? So when it comes to making thermal mass or making mass absorb or not absorb heat, um, shiny and white reflects heat, matte black absorbs heat. And they're the opposite ends of a spectrum. So like it flows all the way between the two, but on the opposite ends of that spectrum, there's shiny white and there's matte black. So let's bring it down to my level and we'll talk about how the heat moves in my home as it stands, right? We have the green box representing um, my house here. And what I've taken is the sun, um, the sun angles and sun sections from last week. And I've just superimposed them on here. The yellow hatched area is full sun. So the areas that are hatched yellow are full sun at some stage during the day and get most of the sun, right? So then the grey hatched area is a permanent shade zone. That's because it's on the other side of the house from the sun. And like, as, as you know, the house will create a shadow behind it, right? So because of that, it leads there to being two zones in our home. We've got a hot zone, which is represented by the red. And we've got a cooler zone, which is represented by the blue. That hot zone is mostly because of passive solar gain, right? So... Passive solar gain is where you get sunlight coming into a space and heating the mass of your house. Um, the radiators are another assist because obviously we don't get enough passive solar gain to heat up our home because of the way it's designed. We can design homes to run off only passive solar gain. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit in the next section. But for the moment, heating my house is done by the radiators and the passive solar gain. The mass of the house gets charged up and then subsequently releases the heat to the house. So to cool our house, we don't have any forced air cooling or anything like that. We use opening our windows. So we open the windows on the second story on the sun side of the house and open the windows on the bottom story on the shade side of the house so that we get a cool airflow that moves through the house. And this is by a process of heat pumping. So because the area at the front is hot, that air wants to expand and get out. And we want to vent that out, so we let it out through the windows. And it creates a small vacuum, like a tiny difference in pressure between the front and the back of the house, which then subsequently pulls the cool air in from the shade zone at the back of the house. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah? Cool. Right? So what, how could I change that flow? 
right? Let's say in Ireland, my house is too cold and I want to get more heat for free. We're going to add more solar mass or we're going to add more thermal mass to the house. And we're going to do that by putting a glass house represented by the white box on the front of the house. Now, what that's going to do is it's going to create an amplified zone of heat. And if we painted the floor or had the floor be a dark color that's matte, we could create a lot more thermal mass in the front of the house. That means that, as you see, the red zone in my house has become much bigger. We're getting more for free. And just by putting that in place, we could offset our heating bill by 20%, 30%, something along those lines, right? Now, obviously, during the summer, that will be a little bit of a difficult space to sell to somebody. You don't want extra heat during the summer. So what if we wanted to cool the house at the front, right? The quickest and easiest way to do it is to plant a tree or place something that's going to create a shade zone. So if we planted an evergreen tree, we'd be getting permanent shade on the front of the house, which would cut down on a cooling bill if that was what we wanted. Or we could put in a deciduous tree, which drops its leaves in the winter. And in that, in that way, we would have the shade in the summer so that we're not getting the intense heat of the summer, but in the winter it would drop its leaves and allow the light in. So we might get a better balance from that. Now, we can take both of these ideas and put them into one thing to make a reactive space at the front of our house, right? So if we took that same glass house and on the outside of it, we grew a deciduous vine. In the summer, it would provide shade, but that area would still get warm in the summer. So we want to open the windows and accentuate that, accentuate that heat pump effect. Because we're making a mass of hot air, it's going to want to ex expand. It's going to want to get out. So we let it out. And in, in, in doing so, we create a small vacuum that pulls cool air in from our shade zone at the back of the house. But then in winter, when we want the maximum amount of heat coming into the space, our deciduous vine, just by nature, drops all its leaves and gives us maximum light penetration, allowing us to use that, that same space as a heating device in the winter, right? So shade and venting in the summer, heat in the winter. Is that making sense? Yeah. So this is an addition to an existing structure. This is a way to make a small addition that can help us to be more sustainable. I know I don't like that word, but it is easier to sustain this building. Now, what else can we do with our zone zero, with our existing home structure? We can supplement or satisfy our electricity needs. And this is one that gets talked about a lot because there's products involved. Whenever there's products involved, people get excited because there's money to be made, right? So you can get oversold on something just because it's a product, right? Cost is equivalent to scale. If I want to supplement my electricity needs, I don't need to invest a huge amount of money. But if I wanted to satisfy my electricity needs, that could be quite a large investment, yeah? Um. I'm going to just quickly touch on AC versus DC, just so we have the, the words, the terminology, right? So AC, alternating current, and DC, direct current, are two, they're two ways of delivering electricity. Now, 90% of the systems that harvest energy from nature are doing it infrequently. So we can't rely on it to always be there. So we normally store it in a battery, right? And batteries provide DC power. Now, the electricity grid is all AC and almost everything in our home is designed to run on AC, alternating current. Um, so if we do want to in, um, incorporate uh, nature harvested energy to our electricity system, we're going to have to have a way to convert DC to AC. 
and that's normally done with an inverter and that's another expense so cost is equivalent to scale applies to everything we're going to talk about here we want to be catching and storing that energy storing that energy is almost as important as catching it it doesn't matter if you can catch it and it just flows away we're going to talk about that with solar panels in a second but the more we can store it the more we have is the best way to put it because these things are infrequent some days it's sunny some days it's not some days it's windy some days it's not but our electricity needs tend to be pretty stable and for the most part if you have a solar system you're going to be using more electricity when the sun is down than when it's up so we have to store that energy so that we can use it when we want it solar panels so the solar system on my house is um a direct to the grid system did you have a question create oh sorry i hit the button by accident <laughs> no problem dude um so we want to supplement our our house electricity needs with solar panels here we have seven panels um which firstly heat a hot water tank and then subsequently flow through the house and out into the grid now we get no payment from the grid for the electricity that we generate which is unfortunate but we also don't capture and store that energy. We don't have any battery banks. We don't have any of the infrastructure that's like for that system. And um, mostly because of expense. Batteries are expensive. AC inverters are expensive. There's like charge controllers. There's all sorts of things that go into storing electricity. And in this particular instance, it was a government granted process. So they were very specific about what you can do. Now, that means that when the sun shines in our house, we all recognize that we have more electricity. So we put on things like the dishwasher. We do things like we use the electric shower. We run the, the laundry washing machine because these things are heavy on electricity. And we at the moment have an, like a surplus of electricity. When the sun isn't shining, we tend not to run these things just because we can wait until they're ready. But we almost always have uh, pretty much unlimited hot water from our system. When we talk about harvesting wind, we normally end up talking about turbines, right? Now, turbines are huge. They're a massive investment. They're also very expensive to run and replace and repair, right? And they have a very limited band of wind that they can operate in. If you think about it, uh, it's like a dynamo on your bicycle, right? But it's huge. It's this big, huge dynamo. So it doesn't actually get cracking, doesn't actually start generating electricity until you get about maybe 10 to 12 kilometers per hour of wind. And then at somewhere around 22 to 24 kilometers of wind, it stops so we're only picking up electricity in that middle bracket because one on one side the um the wind isn't generating enough energy to turn the turbine and on the other side of it we have to stop the fans from turning because the um, turbine itself will overheat right so we're capturing a really really narrow band of electricity and it's a huge expense now, this is a, a product which I've used in two projects in the United States. Um, it's made in France and it's called a wind tree. So all those little pine cones that you see on the tree are individual little turbines. And this thing will get cracking at about four, mi four kilometers per hour of wind. And at about 40, it stops being effective. So that band is huge. And as well as that, the individual pine cones are what you replace. Now they're just put on a, a steel structure. So apart from replacing the occasional pine cone, these things are absolutely free to run, right? And then we can use water to, to um, capture electricity or to capture energy, right? Um, the most, the most well-known is probably a water mill. Most people, 
would regard this as a medieval device. But of all of the things I've just talked about, this is the most efficient way to capture energy. Um, a well-made water mill is 96% efficient. It is capturing 96% of the energy being put at it. Compared to the top of the line, solar cells at the moment are putting out about 17%. So like that is a massive, massive difference. And this is quite a simple system and it operates on the same process we were just talking about. It's like a dynamo. It's like it's like a, a small turbine and it's just constantly going. Now, you do have to have falling water in your property to have something like this. But what you're harvesting is gravity. Gravity is. Um, gravity is pushing that water down. And as that water gets charged with gravity energy, we are harnessing it by letting it fall and catching it as it goes down. Now, obviously, that's quite a large scale in investment. But one thing that I've used is called a water lily. Right. And it, it's the smallest little thing. It's like this big fits in your backpack. And if you put it into running water, like a little stream or anything like that, it will harvest enough energy to be charging your phone or charging your camera when you're out for a hike. Um, it also works with wind, which is really nice. So you can put it on top of your car when you're broken down on the side of the road and you can't get any power. It's really, really a handy little device. And all of these systems need to be storing their energy. We can all catch energy, but if we're not storing it for later use, then we're not making efficient use of it. You had a question, Kian. Yeah, Alex, um, I have a question there. Wait, what's the difference in how uh, a dynamo uh, sort of harnesses energy via water and how a wind turbine does it? Because they sort of seem the same to me. No difference. So how come one is more efficient than the other then? How come the, the dynamo is more efficient than the, than the wind turbine? No, no. So the... The efficiency from a water mill is because you're catching the water as it falls. So the weight of the water, um, weight is mass times gravity. So the weight of the water as it falls into those cups is completely contained. Right. Whereas you're never going to be able to contain air. Air will always escape. It'll, it'll come in and it'll create little eddies inside your turbines. It'll create little, it'll move of its own accord. You're harvesting its momentum because it's moving in various different directions because of various different climatic events, right? Whereas when we're falling, when you're falling water, it's always moving in one direction. It's always falling down. So we can, we can prepare ourselves and design a much more efficient system. Like I said, it's, it's the most effective machine we've ever made. I don't know why there isn't more of them everywhere, to be very honest. I suppose we look at it as like a medieval thing. So we kind of discount it as like stupid and old, but that's not true. <laughs> cool. So what else can our house do? We've already talked about heating and cooling itself. We've talked about generating more electricity for ourselves. And that's going to take a huge chunk out of our economy. Um, the amount of money that we have to put in to run our homes. Right. So we can grow food. Um, I already chatted about the microgreens um, on an earlier video and uh, we chatted a little bit before class about them as well. The ones over my shoulder, um, they're kind of difficult to see because it's a bit bright, but um, they are eight days old now, I think. And I'm just going to harvest this afternoon. Now, those are a small addition uh, supplement to my diet. I usually have them in sandwiches and salad and like um, my midday meal normally has a handful of microgreens in them. And the reason that they're a good addition to our um, indoor space is because A, they're providing oxygen, brand new, fresh oxygen into our space. But they're also providing a lot of trace nutrients, a lot of trace elements that aren't present in the adult plant. Right. So as the plant grows, it uses um, things like zinc, magnesium, selenium it uses these things to build itself and then subsequently they get used up whereas when we catch them at that like inch inch and a half tall they haven't gotten a chance to use those yet and they're contained in the seed 
They're already there. We just need to catch it before the plant uses it. I know that sounds kind of, um, I know that sounds kind of poaching, but you know, it's not a bad addition to a system, right? We could also grow with hydroponics indoors. Now, hydroponics is where soil is not used to grow. We grow plants in a in a medium. So we just need to give them something to grab onto with their roots so that they can grow up without falling over. But we don't provide them any soil. Normally the soil is where their food is. Instead, we use a nutrient solution. So we make we make watery nutrients for them and we flush their system so that their roots can pick it up, but we're not using any soil. So the, the systems that hydroponics, they're very good. I don't particularly like using them because the um, food that comes out of them tends to be a little bit watery. It tends to have a little less flavor, but a perfect addition if you have the space and you have the money involved. Again, cost equals is equivalent to scale, right? Vertical farming is another great way to use, um, especially a sunlit wall in your house. If you've got one wall in your house that always gets sun, you have the opportunity to grow some plants in containers in your home. And you would do this by stacking them on top of each other in little containers. Um, one of the best examples of this that I've seen was in a house in New York. Um, the woman that I was living with had a, um, a herb garden, for want of a better description, climbing up a wall in her apartment and it was as productive as the same amount of land flat down so it was like a little probably like a 24 square foot growing space but it was vertical instead of being horizontal very effective and again that didn't take much investment but it did take planning what else can our house do we can use it to recycle water so Using grey water is a great way to double the amount of water you get. Now, that's an interesting way to put it if we're, if we're on the grid. So if we're on the grid, we're using double the amount of water if we don't use our grey water. Um, if we're off the grid and we're capturing our own water, it definitely extends our, the life of our water tanks. Um, I'll just take a second to quickly differentiate. So we have clean water. Um, that's the stuff we drink, uh, the stuff we brush our teeth, maybe the stuff we shower in, right? After we've used it, um, hoping that we don't put any nasty chemicals into it, it becomes grey water. So it's grey in that it is, it is nutrient rich for plants. It's dirty in the term of like, we wouldn't drink it, but plants love it, especially like hand washing water or um, vegetable washing water, stuff like that, where you're getting all these little bits and pieces for the soil. And it's, it's really, really effective for growing plants. And then we've got black water. And black water is any water that has made contact with fecal matter. Fecal matter is destructive to water quality in a lot of ways. Um, so we can't use black water for growing anything we want to eat. Um, and it generally tends to be kind of stinky, so we normally have to send it away from us quite quickly. Another thing we can do with our home is we can support, support a micro herd. This is another way of reusing waste, right? Um, compost worm farms can be indoors or outdoors. Um, next week, we're going to talk about zone two and three. And outside my house, or zone one and two, sorry. We're going to talk about zone one outside my house where I have my compost worm farm. But you can have a compost worm farm in your house. They are completely silent. They don't smell and they just eat your leftovers. The only things they don't particularly like are animal products and citrus. Apart from that, everything goes in and they will eat their own weight every day. Now, compost worms have two amazing products. They've got Worm juice, which is when water is flowed through their system, you get a very heavy bacterial um, solution. Uh, it's kind of like prebiotics for your soil, probiotics for your soil. Um, and then you've got worm castings or worm compost, which is an incredibly effective growing material. Um, these two are unbelievably valuable for growing plants. Can't get away from how awesome um, compost worms are. They're just fantastic.
Is there any questions on that? Do we all understand all those points? Yeah. Thank you so much for watching. If you learned something interesting, please go teach someone immediately. It's a very important tool, helps to cement it in your mind and spreading the good news is always a good idea. In the next video, we're going to dive into a new build, a new structure in zone zero.